All right, commissioners, uh, next we have, uh, under presentations, we have uh, Ken Cozell, University of Maryland, Shore Regional Health CEO, and uh, for an update, so come on up. And uh, if you look at tab number six, I believe there is an agenda in there of some speaking points that uh, these gentlemen will be uh, covering this evening. Yeah, item uh, Roman numeral two on page 23, tab number six. So, gentlemen. Good evening, ladies, gentlemen. Good evening, how are you tonight? Marvelous. Thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to spend a little time with you this evening and give you an update on Shore Regional Health. Before I get started, I'd like to introduce Dr. Walter, Walter Atha. Uh, Dr. Atha is our Regional Director for Emergency Services. So Dr. Atha has oversight responsibility of all four of our emergency departments within Shore Regional Health. Uh, so I asked him to come here today because what we'd like to speak with you a little bit about this evening is uh, we'll start with a high level overview of COVID-19 and share with you, with you where we are with our COVID uh, pandemic fight. We'll also then shift to our emergency center and some of the volume trends that we've seen in our emergency center and uh, why we're experiencing those higher volumes. Then we'll get into some conversation about the alert statuses that we've been experiencing both here in Queen Anne's as well as in Easton. Uh, and, and that's been a challenge I know that you're aware of uh, for some time. So we'll talk a little, bit, a little bit about that and make sure we answer your questions there. And then finally, we'll give you a brief update on our urgent care vision for Kent Island and for Queen Anne's County. So hopefully that uh, covers some of the items you'll talk, you want us to talk about. But if you've got any questions along the way or anything else you want to speak to, we'll be happy to address those as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. And I think we, we have uh, one minute and 22 seconds on the clock. <laughs> oh, no. you're, not, you're not on a timer. <laughs> <laughs> the seat is warm, though. So I'll, <laughs> well, well, again, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be with you tonight. And uh, as you are fully aware, we are 18 months now into COVID-19. And I don't know about you, but I'm about tired of this. <laughs> and I'm, I really am. But, but one thing that um, I think it's important to share is that we are so grateful and proud of the partnership that we have established between Shore and Queen Anne's County and, and how we fought this fight together, and not just the COVID fight, but how the communities have come together during these trying times to focus on working collaboratively with each other to help resolve some of these challenges. And uh, Mary Alice actually shared a brief story with me, uh, a recent story about what happened during a mass casualty event that we experienced here in the county where uh, members of the Queen Anne's County community, EMS, fire, other support personnel for the county came to the aid of the Queen Anne's Emergency Center when we needed it most, when we had an influx of patients come into our facility. They not only showed up and were present, but they were actively engaged in the care and management of those patients as they came through the Emergency Center. And that's the type of collaboration and partnership that just really fills my heart with pride that we are a small community taking care of each other, especially when we need each other most. And that's exactly what we've been doing with COVID over the last 18 months. It's not been easy. We, we are now in the fourth peak of this pandemic, believe it or not. And we are still seeing an enormous amount of inpatients coming through our system that are COVID positive. When I looked at the latest data today, we focus, I'll focus on the UM system, the University of Maryland medical system in total. We have 150 inpatients that are positive for COVID in our UMS facilities. And that number has been climbing over the last several weeks. So that's what we're starting to see. And it's in large part because of the Delta variant. We're seeing Delta in uh, with COVID positive patients resulting in admissions in our hospitals. And in large part, it's for patients who have not been vaccinated with either Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson. And, and Phil, you shake your head and I do too, because we have the cure. We have the answer right in front of us. And it's just a matter of getting our community our collective community of the, of the country behind this pan, uh, behind the, the vaccinations. Yeah, real quick, I just want to stop you there because for clarification. So when you're saying it's the Delta variant, do we have a separate test for the Delta variant versus the old Corona or is, I mean, how do we know it's Delta variant? I guess my question. Well, uh, it, it, it's on a population basis because essentially early on when we were trying to determine what the new pathogen was, uh, CDC and local uh, health authorities did, did actually separate out and do specific tests to confirm that it was COVID, that it was Delta variant. But as that became the dominant strain, they stopped testing specifically and now it's just Corona and assumed to be Delta. 
So we don't know how many Deltas, how many old corona there may be? It became the overwhelming predominant strain, and so they stopped uh, speciating. Okay. To my understanding, I'm not spe- I am yeah. shouldn't speak in expertise of, public. It's like influenza A versus influenza B, more or less. Is where exactly, you're exactly. Yeah. We yeah. follow the strain, and when it B becomes dominant, then we say it's flu, and that's what's out in the community. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So as I mentioned, about 150 patients in the UM system, and what we're seeing is about 25% of those patients are sick enough to be admitted into our intensive care units. And those are the, the units where the most intensive care is needed and the sickest patients are located within our hospitals. And another 25% of those patients are on ventilators, which are mechanical breathing devices that uh, promote breathing. So that's when you're really sick and you've got this disease as far as it will likely take you. I'm sorry, Ken, out of the 150, th- yeah. th- those numbers are ums on here on the shore? UMS total, that's, that's oh, UMS all total. of the UMS hospitals. I was gonna take the plane down for a minute and get the shore specifically, but at UMS, that's what we're seeing. Okay, all right. How and many then of those said, are vaccinated? Uh, I don't have those specific numbers for the 150, but the trends we're seeing are 75, 80, 90% are unvaccinated. And then of those 150, how many did you say were on respirators? About 25%, 25%, 25% in the ICU and 25% in the, uh, on, on ventilators. Are you seeing any vaccinated in ICU? We do see vaccinated patients in the ICU. We do, uh, but what we, I think, I should let the physician speak, but uh, what, what I believe we're seeing is that those are, are, are sick patients. Those are yeah, patients right. that are immunocompromised, sure. exactly. comorbidities, they are very, very sick. So uh, it's, it's possible that they would have been admitted even had they not had COVID. I take your so, point. So yeah. COVID's not the primary yeah. diagnosis necessarily. Right. Um, uh, now, taking the plane down for a second at shore, what we're seeing here on the midshore is, is single digits with admissions to our hospitals. Um, so we're not in double digits, but we've seen that, that flux back. We were running zero for, for several weeks at a time and felt like we were ready to do the victory lap. But that's when we started to, to uh, increase our numbers, and now we're hovering between five and ten patients a day, primarily out of our Easton Hospital. So we're seeing that number of patients on the Eastern Shore that are COVID positive, same relative percentage of vaccinated versus unvaccinated, and roughly about 25% of those patients are in our ICUs, but only about 10% are on ventilators. So that's kind of the types of patients we're seeing at the shore. Um, And again, I think our challenge has been, how do we eradicate this pandemic once and for all? So, so we, we, we have the solution, and, and, but, to, but to be honest with you, uh, this back in August, when we made a decision as part of the University of Maryland medical system to mandate vaccines for our workforce, it uh, wasn't necessarily a popular decision then because the federal government hadn't come out yet. The governor in the state of Maryland did talk about, uh, did talk about vaccinations and the importance, but the University of Maryland stepped out and said, not only do we expect that you're, you get vaccinated, but we're gonna put it as a condition of employment. And that's kind of where we're going towards as an organization over the next couple of days. On October 1st, a couple of days from now, you'll have to be vaccinated to be a, a team member at the, within the University of Maryland medical system of which Shore is a part of. Which, which is gonna be interesting because you're already talking about a, a, a well underserved profession as far as your, your nursing staff. And- Absolutely. And so what's, you know, what's that gonna do to staffing that's already running thin anyway? It is a challenge, no doubt. There, it's a tough decision to make. And this challenge is not unique to Shore. It's not unique to the University of Maryland. This is a national crisis. Do you mandate flu shots already? Yes, sir, we do. So they already get, the ones that are working now already get a flu shot? Yes, sir, we do. That's correct. And that's that we're coming up on that season as we speak. So it's, October is, the, is flu season. So we're going to begin to mandate flu vaccinations for our team members as well. Now, there are a few exceptions that apply if you have a religious exemption or if you have an a medical condition yeah. that's approved by a physician, you can have an exemption to being vaccinated. The other is a deferral. If you're pregnant, we can defer your vaccination during pregnancy, but when you deliver, there, there's an expectation and a time frame associated with being vaccinated. So minus those exceptions, our entire workforce within the University of Maryland medical system, about 30,000 strong, need to be vaccinated and October 1 is what our What percentage time are you now vaccinated, do you think? Yeah, so as, as an UM system, we're a slightly over 90%, so 90, 91%. Oh, well done. At, at the shore system, about the same. We're seeing about the done. same number of vaccinated. Our challenge is how do we get from those that aren't vaccinated now to vaccinated by October 1 and, and making sure that one, they're aware of the consequences, which I think everyone is at this point. We've been 
talking about this for some time now, uh, that they're aware of the expectations of what we have and that they're aware of the ramifications of, of their decision. Does this run the full gamut of employees, nurses, doctors, maintenance? Uh, Everyone, everything? yes, even contracted employees that come in to do work in our facilities, volunteers, and all levels of employees, yes. Everybody you walk into that building, you'll be vaccinated. That's correct. So that's where we are. The timeline is October 1st. We are, we are offering vaccinations, numerous vaccinations between now and then. We have enough vaccine supply to vaccinate every one of our team members who has not been vaccinated. And they can still get the J&J &J vaccine between now and October 1st and meet the policy's requirements. So, so there is still that window, but the, the clock is ticking. And we really do it, gentlemen, because while working in healthcare is, is truly an honor, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to work in healthcare and provide healthcare for our patients. But with that privilege, I believe comes responsibility. And that responsibility is to do all we can to care for our patients and, our, and their visitors and our team members in as safe a manner as possible. And we know that the vaccine is the safest solution for this pandemic. And that's why the mandate exists. Uh, it's a privilege, but we've got responsibilities and, and now's the time to, to own up to those responsibilities. So that's where we are with COVID. Um, uh, we hope that uh, we get to 100% vaccination rate before October 1st. That's our goal, and we're doing everything we can to make that happen. Just for curiosity, is is uh, is Shore Easton? Let me fr frame it like the state of the art in treatment. Do you do monoclonal? Do you do everything, or would you transfer it somewhere else if it was a very complex case? I'll ask the doctor to. Uh, and I'm speaking for my colleagues in the ICU because this is not my specialty, but, but we, we certainly do take care of every patient who doesn't require a service that we cannot provide. So uh, to, to answer the first part of your question, monoclonal antibodies actually are not indicated for admitted patients. They're for patients, for who? For patients who are admitted to the hospital. There are other options. There are some options that have some degree of efficacy, and we do follow all the, the guidelines as they've developed. Um, and I'll speak generally as a physician, again, and not as an ID expert, but I will say that dealing with a pathogen that we've only known about for 18 months and declaring absolute terms is, is challenging in terms of the, the efficacy of the treatments, but we follow the standards and we, we do pro, uh, proning uh, protocol, in case you've heard of that, is that it increases the lung's ability to oxygenate if a patient is on their face down. Uh, so we do all of these. Yeah, I was here. listening to a BBC report this morning that had an extensive review of the tr treatments that were affected and steroids and monoclonals were the leading. Yes. So it's interesting you do not provide that. Is that okay. correct? And to the community, well, we provide the, the monoclonal antibodies as what's well. What's your... We, we coordinate with the community resources to provide mono, monoclonal antibodies to, to patients who are discharged and are still out in the community as well. So that's one of the benefits of being part of the University of Maryland medical system is that there is a staffing pool that every member organization can tap into if needed. And our benefit is that staffing pool will help support our monoclonal antibody infusion therapies. So uh, we do not currently offer it now. We've been struggling with staffing, but with that pool coming to the Eastern Shore, likely within the next week to 10 days, we'll reintroduce monoclonal antibody treatments to our community. So we did, we were, we had to back off because of staffing, because of the pool within UMS, we have it now. And I think within the next 10 days, we'll reinstitute that on the shore. Very important as a treatment therapy to prevent hospitalizations uh, and, and to prevent those patients who are newly diagnosed from really getting sick and needing higher levels of care. That's very reassuring. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. So switching gears from COVID, uh, we wanted to state the obvious, which is notwithstanding COVID, we have been incredibly busy within our emergency center here in Queen Anne's, as well as in all four emergency departments that Dr. Uh, Atha oversees. So uh, I asked Dr. Atha to just give you a high level overview of the volumes, the acuity levels, the types of patients that we're seeing uh, in Queen Anne's, in Easton, as well as on the mid shore. So doctor. Sure, um, so if you guys were aware, uh, um, uh, early in the pandemic, the numbers dropped off dramatically. And we were very concerned because people who needed emergency services for chest pain, strokes and so forth, were avoiding hospitals completely because we knew so little about the pathogen. And people were very concerned about about you know coming to the hospital. So our volumes dropped tremendously, and reflecting a nationwide trend of as much as 30, 40 percent drop in emergency department visits. 
At this point, we have reconstituted that volume at three of the four sites, uh, Dorchester, Easton, and Chestertown to somewhere around 90 to 95% of pre-COVID volumes. Queen Anne's is at 120 plus percent of pre-COVID volumes. Um, uh, so for example, Queen Anne's pre-COVID routinely saw somewhere around 45 to 50 patients a day. Our most recent record was 83 patients in one day. And I can speak to that because I was there, so I'll pat myself <laughs> on the back for that. But it was quite busy and, and a facility that is historically used to handling volumes of 40 to 50. I, I have to congratulate the staff um, for being able to handle it beautifully. Um, of course, there have been times where we're using the waiting room for the first time at the existence of the facility, reflecting the volumes going up. But we have had a very low walkout rate. Our satisfaction scores have remained high, and patients are still getting the care that they come to expect at that facility. So I congratulate the staff on having weathered it and, and continue to provide exemplary care. Um, and, and I would second uh, Mr. Cozell's comments uh, from, from Mary Alice and also from Dr. Wong about, uh, about the partnerships with, uh, with EMS is that, is that the understanding it, back and forth in terms of the challenges faced on both sides of patient care delivery and the continuity of that, the relationship between EMS and the facility, I, th I, I think they remain strong. People are, of course, frayed thin. This is a very challenging era, uh, both in EMS and hospital care and every other delivery of healthcare system, and of course every other field in the country, not just healthcare. Um, but tensions run high, and, uh, and we've dealt with situations that have flamed occasionally, but generally the relationship remains as amicable as it has been in the past. Now, I, as you know, we, all of us follow the, uh, follow the uh, num numerics and metrics of the system, and certainly as the summer wore on, it was very clear that the that the alert system, which is I, before we get into whether the alert is a good or system or not, that thing began to back up in a very alarming kind of way because normally in summer we'd be dropping down to the very low digits or zero or something, and here we work 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours, then it turned 100. Then it turned 145 out of 166 hours in a week. And then one week it was 225 hours, which was, I'd never seen a number like that in all my days. And I, I wrote you a letter, mm -hmm. and that letter said that it concerned Queen Anne's County that if the ER was that, the whole operation was that stressed at this time of the year, when we wound up down in the deep days of January, when the load really comes on with ear infections and backups in the ER room, how, how did, you know, what, what was, it? I wasn't interested in it so much in the descriptive which you sent us, saying, talking about retention and recruitment and so on, as it was a predictive statement about how you thought things would shape up this winter when it seemed to me nothing but more stress lay ahead of you. So that's what I'm interested in. Thank you for that question. And, and I, I think what we've seen over that's trending is that when we are most busy, it's usually that everyone around us is busy as well. And what we've found is that there's a correlation between when we're on alert status in Queen Anne's for yellow alert with other hospitals on the other side of the Western on, on the Western shore also being on alert status because they're incredibly busy as well. So oftentimes those patients are brought over to Queen Anne's. No, we, we see them in Queen Anne's. The acuity of those patients, the, the degree of their illness is, is usually sometimes higher than what we are accustomed to in the emergency center at Queen Anne's. So those patients are dropped off from the Western shore. They're cared for in Queen Anne's. They're sicker, so they take a little bit more resources and they're harder to place to that next level of facility, either back in Anne Arundel County in a nursing home or assisted living facility, or in a healthcare facility, which is all packed with inpatients and on other types of alerts. So it's an incredible challenge, and we see that correlation happen pretty regularly in our Queenstown facility. There's a direct correlation there of those patients that come east from the west. And I think it's gonna take a strategy, uh, Commissioner, to sit down and talk with our partners across the western shore and figure out a way that we can work together more closely to prevent these types of transfers back and forth 
because it does have an effect on our emergency center, which isn't designed to be the same as a hospital ED. It's a freestanding emergency center, and there are some limitations to the types of patients we should be seeing in that facility. And I think we have to just work collaboratively with our partners on the other side of the shore to no, understand I, and appreciate that. I, I certainly accept that and, and appreciate the fact we had heard reports that they were getting overloaded over there. And certainly the numbers we see constantly mirror your numbers also. Right. You know, you'd be at 140, they'd be at 80 or 90 or 100 hours. But that notwithstanding, it doesn't really answer the question what you think are, are our citizens going to be sitting for three, four, five, six hours in January and February when the ear infections and all the school, normal school traffic starts to come in? I, I, the reason I bring this up is not to badger you. It's for a somewhat different motive, which is that if, if we can drive any more people into getting vaccinated knowing that the system in the winter is going to be even under more stress, it would seem to me that having the public be aware of that would be positive for the public. So that's Very not an intention to, you know. For the folks that may be on the fence about getting a vaccine or not, yeah. this could push them to making the decision the to point. go ahead and yeah. get it done. Absolutely. 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 Our wait times in the e, uh, ER are growing. Our, our, yeah. our ability to treat you in a timely manner is growing. And in some part, it is because of unvaccinated yeah, community members. There's this no is doubt. no attempt to, you know, to complain or whine about things. I'm just concerned, and all of us are, about the, the capacity of the system. If you're stressed out now, what the hell is going to be improving when you got more load and more burnt out people in, in, in late December? Mr. And I, Marcel, one of your members, well, it's yes. okay, sorry. They had said something. They want to share something that's on the screen. This now. is the graph. Oh, that's the, yeah. yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, but that graph depicts the volume increases over time. And what you see at the lowest dipping point there, about three quarters in from the slide left to right, is COVID. That's the COVID volumes at Queen Anne's Emergency Center when we were in, in the beginning stages of COVID. Right. And as you can see, as we've climbed out of COVID into different peaks, the, the latest point on the far right hand side is where our volumes are today. And that's what Dr. Atha was saying is that depicts kind of that high level of acuity and high level of patients that we're seeing today in Queen Anne's. So it did dip and it's growing and growing and growing over time. And in large part, it's, it's COVID vaccinations, but it's also what Dr. Atha said before, it's, it's people that have pent up need that didn't experience the emergency department when they probably should have uh, several months ago. And we see it, I mean, our, our transport volume is, we hit almost 90 last week, if I'm not mistaken, and our typical run would be more 60 or something. So it's really walking up here too. And we recognize though, that there are limita staffing limitations. So there are certainly challenges with staffing and, and making sure that we've got enough staffing, not just in Queen Anne's, but in Easton. So we can support the flow of those patients through the ER and to the inpatient units. So we can accept more patients in the ER. Dr. Atha and I and a bunch of others are working on solutions there. But we also feel like another solution, and it's not gonna happen unfortunately before November or December, but another solution for Queen Anne's County is an urgent care center here. And it is getting urgent care. So those types of illnesses that don't require emergency department care can be seen safely, timely, and a great experience level. And unfortunately, we are still working on a lease agreement for the space that we've identified. We haven't got to terms with two national companies trying to get to terms on their agreement before they'll sign a lease agreement for us. Uh, but we are working that to the very end degree. And when we get that lease signed, and we hope we're close, um, it'll take about 16 weeks, about four months to retrofit the space that exists into an urgent care facility. And it's right on Ken Island and we'll be able to see patients oh, in this community news, for urgent care. But uh, I, we can't start that 16, month, uh, 16 week time clock until we get this lease agreement signed. And unfortunately there's, uh, some of that's out of our control. We have to have the two parties that are involved with us getting to yes before we can get the lease agreement signed. So that's kind of where we are, but that's our, that's our 10,000 foot view of COVID, the implications of violence, the alert statuses, and, and our, one of our strategies to address some of the challenges here. Just for the curiosity, because everybody in this room and everybody in the United States hears about the staffing issue, what is it that, what is it that ran the staff off? I mean, 
I mean, a very interesting point is you constantly, first it sounded like they were getting hired somewhere else, but everywhere you went. I, I think it's multifactorial. It's, it's some of our team, nurse, let's, let's say nurses in general for a second. Some of our nurses have decided to retire. They are at that retirement age and they just right. said, you know what, I'm, I'm, thank you, I'm done, I'm, I'm burned out, I'm gonna retire. Others have said similar things, but they're not at retirement age, so they've gone out of the profession, maybe into a doctor's office status, maybe into a, a lesser acuity type of hospital environment, so they're still in the profession, but they're not in the ER or in the inpatient unit. So, so some have migrated into a different type of nursing position. Others have migrated out of the field completely and just have transformed their careers into something different outside of hospital, healthcare, and nursing in general. So we're seeing more and more of that, and that just accelerated. And then the fact that we're having fewer come back into the system to backfill those that left, that, that's where the challenge Do you see it across the whole spectrum with the PAs and the nurse practitioners, or is it confined to the nurse? I, I, I don't, and maybe Walt has a better perspective on this. I think the PAs and the nurse practitioners are, are growing. They're, they're growing in numbers and strength because I think they're gonna fill a niche for us. They're gonna fill a, a specific void that's necessary and essential yeah. to support the providers, the, the medical the physicians, as well as complement the nursing staff's uh, care, care, care plan. So Thanks. I think that's gonna continue to grow over time. Okay. And, and hospitals have to pivot to address that and, and, and incorporate them yeah. more closely into the care model. Thank you. You're welcome. That's it from me. Any other questions? Yeah. No. Oh, just real quick, just out of curiosity. I said no. No. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Shot. I started I know, putting my papers together. No, I'm, I'm. Just real quick. So uh, elective surgeries, how's that still kind of on a standby thing? Great question. Uh, at, at points in times during Great COVID, question. Just that. At, at points in times during COVID, we did have to back off on elective right. surgeries. And the reason why is because the great staff that works in the operating room has said, we'll transfer our skill set to the inpatient unit sure, because sure. there was a, such a void so there. Is that where you are still? No, uh, well, they are fantastic. I, uh, we are blessed because it, it worked out well and we've learned from it and we've modified and tweaked it so it's, it's going to be even more effective. But today we're at 100% capacity with our operating room so we haven't made that transition. But that's a tool in the toolbox that we may have to use after October 1st or if right. these shortages and challenges continue. Sure. But today we're at 100%, but the nursing teams and our ORs that have made those transitions have been incredible. The inpatient unit nurses have accepted them and embraced them as part of the care team there. And it's helped us through some very dire straits. Well, I think it's important that you leave those hero signs up in front yeah. of your facilities because they, they still are. I agree, and, and I agree still wholeheartedly. And, and our entire workforce is the heroes because it takes an entire care team to care for a patient or support services our nurses, our techs, our medical technologists, imaging, our doctors too, I guess, to some degree. I, I, I can't speak for my fellow commissioners, but, but 2019 and 2020 saw me at the um, Easton Memorial Hospital, uh, regional hospital for a couple of things that I had to deal with it, three days, four days that was there on both occasions. And the nursing staff just, I mean, you can't say enough great things about them. They were just amazing. Thank you for that. Just shy spectacular. Often wonder where they hide their wings. Wow. I couldn't agree more. And we are blessed and we're a community taking care of each other. And that's what we're all about. So again, thank you for our partnership. Thank you for the support we get from every single person in Queen Anne's County and, and the support team. We can't do what we do without you. It's still gonna be rough roads ahead for us, but uh, we'll get through this together. So, and the, and the public can help get your COVID vaccine get your flu vaccine, yes. go to your primary care physician regularly so it doesn't develop into something that requires critical care or the ER. That's some stuff that the public can do to sort of help out on this. And that's so we have the space for those who really need it to get that emergency treatment that they need. Couldn't have said it better myself. Well, thank I, you I so much. I also want to thank you. My, I had one of my daughters at the ER in Queenstown this summer with a very life-saving diagnosis. You guys were fantastic, so thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. We'll pass that on and we appreciate your support. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. Thanks for the time.